This is Larry Moore. I'd like to welcome you back to our biological wastewater treatment uh, training series. Uh, today we'll be doing presentation number 10. We'll be talking about aerobic sludge digestion. So we're uh, going a little bit different direction today. So far, first nine presentations have all been about activated sludge wastewater treatment. And now we're going to talk about how we uh, aerobically digest the sludge. So as far as our outline, uh, we're gonna be looking at just briefly the sludge treatment and disposal options available to us. And then we'll talk about sludge stabilization, uh, fundamentals of uh, stabilization, uh, aerobic digester operating conditions, and may use thickener clarifiers in conjunction with the aerobic digester. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ATAD process, which is uh, a thermophilic uh, aerobic digestion process. And then we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of aerobic digestion of sludge. So again, when we operate an activated sludge wastewater treatment plant, we may generate primary sludge and secondary sludge uh, that have to be uh, treated or um, we have quite a few activated sludge processes that do not use primary sludge treatment and so or primary settling so that uh, all we have to deal with is the waste activated sludge. At any rate, as you can see in this diagram, there are quite a few um, options as far as what to do with the uh, sludge. Most of them have to do with reducing the water content of the sludge or increasing the, the solids content of the sludge. Uh, we do that through thickening and dewatering and also employing chemical condition, con chemical conditioning to enhance thickening and dewatering. And we may actually burn the sludge to uh, drive off more of the water uh, to produce uh, uh, material that's mostly ash and, uh, and very low in, in water content, high in solids content, so we have less material that we take to a landfill. But at any rate, a number of options, but we're going to focus on this one, stabilization. We can stabilize biologically or we can stabilize with lime, but we're going to talk about aerobic stabilization of sludge in this presentation. So why stabilize? Well, if we want to apply the sludge or biosolids to uh, um, farmland or, or pasture land or forest land, uh, we want to reduce the pathogen content of the sludge so that it's safe for people who might come in contact with it. And we also want to uh, reduce the vector attraction potential of the sludge. And there we're talking about attracting flies and birds and rats that uh, would uh, be very much attracted to raw sludge. We want to stabilize the sludge and again, uh, oxidize most of the organic matter and reduce its attractiveness to these, uh, these vectors. So we have uh, in the federal 503 regulations uh, requirements for pathogen reduction and vector attraction reduction that we have to meet uh, as we uh, process the sludge. If we stabilize again, we have some options. We can use aerobic sludge digestion, anaerobic sludge digestion, and we can also stabilize with lime by raising the pH up around uh, 12 for a certain amount of time, and that will uh, destroy the pathogens and, and achieve lime stabilization. But we're going to focus, as I said, on aerobic digestion of sludge. Well, for processing uh, primary sludge, then we got that fresh organic matter that came in in the raw wastewater. But the process is similar. We're going to oxidize it in the aerobic digester, convert it into cell mass, energy for cells, convert some of the CO2 and water and other end products. But if we take waste activated sludge, <clears throat> which is our biomass that we waste from the activated sludge system, then those biological cells, which we represent as C5H7O2N, then that will be oxidized to CO2 and water and ammonia during aerobic digestion. So this is stabilization of organic matter, particularly in the primary sludge and in the waste activated sludge, primarily we're uh, going to 
kick the process into endogenous respiration and burn up or oxidize the biological cell mass as much as possible and convert it to gaseous end products. So if we look at our microbial growth, growth curve, which I've shown you in previous presentations, we have several uh, growth phases. We have lag, exponential growth, stationary growth, and then we get into the death or endogenous phase. And I may have mentioned that when we operate activated sludge, normally we'll operate it somewhere in this range, in the stationary phase into the uh, death or endogenous phase. So when the sludge comes out, uh, it's, it's partially oxidized, but it still has some uh, biomass that, that needs digestion. And so in aerobic digestion, we're going to push it further into endogenous decay or the death phase and try to fairly completely oxidize that biomass to CO2 and water, ammonia, and other end products. As far as temperature of uh, biological processes, we have bacteria that perform well in different ranges. Uh, we have psychrophilic bacteria that form mainly in the zero to 20 degrees C range, uh, mesophilic uh, from about 15 degrees to 40 degrees C, thermophilic that perform well in the range of about uh, four, 45 degrees C up to about 65 uh, degree C, and then you have the hypothermophilic ranges that you see. So uh, different bacteria will thrive in these different uh, temperature uh, environments. So when we aerobically digest sludge in conventional aerobic digestion, and we're basically operating in the mesophilic uh, temperature range. And if we're digesting waste activated sludge, again, we represent the biomass, C58702N. You'll be oxidized to CO2 and water and ammonia. And then that ammonia that's released by the first reaction, it will be oxidized then to nitrate in the aerobic digester. So if we add those two equations together, we get one equation that looks like this. So we see that it takes seven moles of oxygen to oxidize one mole of biomass in terms of mass quantity, seven times 32 uh, divided by the molecular weight of biomass, which is 113, seven times 32 divided by 113, uh, that equals 1.98. So the, the actual fine tuned number, it takes 1.98 pounds of oxygen to completely oxidize a pound of biomass. So we round it off and say that our theoretical oxygen requirements are two pounds of oxygen per pound of biomass destroyed. Now an actual design will provide uh, a little bit more oxygen to make sure we uh, uh, have adequate oxygen to ensure complete uh, oxidation of the biomass. So an aerobic digestion to meet the federal 40 CFR 503 regulation for uh, sludge is gonna be applied to the land. Uh, we wanna, uh, we're required to digest the sludge if you use conventional aerobic digestion for 40 days at 20 degrees C or if the temperatures in our digesters 15 degrees C, we'll need a digestion time of 60 days and that's to uh, satisfy uh, the 503 regulations with respect to uh, pathogen reduction. Uh, we'll design the digester for a volatile solids loading of 0.1 to 0.3 pounds of volatile solids per cubic feet of digester capacity per day. Again, the oxygen requirements, 2.3 pounds of oxygen per pound of BSS destroyed. Uh, we'll normally provide 100 to 200 horsepower per million gallons of mixing intensity in the aerobic digester to make sure that we have adequate mixing. And oftentimes in the aerobic digester, the mixing requirements will control the size of the aeration equipment rather than the oxygen requirements. And typically we'd like to maintain one to two milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen as we operate the aerobic digester. 
and typically we can expect to achieve 38 to 50 percent reduction of volatile suspended solids uh, as a result of aerobic digestion of our sludge. So how we operate the aerobic digester depends on a number of items, uh, depends on whether we're going to be directly applying the treated sludge to, uh, to the land, or if we're going to take the sludge after digestion and uh, send it to dewatering. And we have various types of dewatering equipment. Um, but again, we want to uh, process that sludge and get it ready for dewatering if that's appropriate. Uh, if we have to, if we're trying to produce class A biosolids, which are the high quality, we get class A and class B. Class A biosolids uh, is very high quality. It can be applied to flower beds and, and uh, used as a fertilizer and soil amendment and with, with, with little, with few restrictions. And uh, if we produce class B sludge, there are some restrictions in terms of its use on the land. But uh, again, if we're producing class A biosolids, we'll have more stringent requirements as far as the way the digester operates. Or if we're just hauling the sludge away, again, whether it's going to a landfill or a land application site, uh, again, that will impact uh, how we operate the digester. The influent sludge characteristics are important. The, the, the suspended solids concentration of the sludge typically Waste activated sludge will have a so, so, suspended solids concentration of about 1% or about 10,000 milligrams per liter. And it'll be about typically uh, 60 to 90% volatile solids, depending upon the type of activated sludge process we have. And um, if we're dealing with primary sludge, the uh, solids content of primary sludge may be uh, uh, 3% or 4%. So it's usually more concentrated. How often we waste, uh, most of your larger plants will waste activated sludge on a daily basis or maybe a continual basis. The smaller treatment plants, they may waste uh, a few hours a day or they may, may waste their sludge one day a week. Uh, I always uh, am a proponent of wasting a little bit of sludge every day, but the plant uh, will have their own wasting uh, frequency and we need to be aware of that. If we're chemically treating the sludge uh, uh, to enhance thickening or dewatering, um, or if we're, let's say we're chemically treating to enhance thickening prior to aerobic digestion, then the chemical treatment of the sludge may affect how we operate the digester. And then the digester itself, it's operating conditions. Again, we can operate in the batch mode or the continuous mode. We can use single or multi-tank uh, aerobic digesters. Uh, and we may have surface aeration. We may have blowers with diffused aeration. Um, typically, I, I'd say that we prefer blowers with diffused aeration in an aerobic digester uh, because that will tend to uh, uh, conserve the heat a little bit better in the, uh, in the digester. Uh, the amount of oxygen provided, again, we've got to supply the oxygen needed to oxidize the biomass. But typically, as I said earlier, the uh, aeration requirements are based on mixing intensity rather than oxygen requirements in an aerobic digester. And then what kind of automation we have and instrumentation we have also impacts how we operate our aerobic digester. So if we're talking about producing class B sludge, um, then to achieve vector, excuse me, pathogen reduction uh, requirements, uh, one way to do that is to provide an MCRT of 60 days, a sludge age of 60 days in the digester at 15 degrees C or 40 days at 20 degrees C. And if we do that, then we satisfied the pathogen reduction requirements for class B sludge. Or we can actually measure the pathogen content of the sludge after we've digested it. And if it's less than 2 million col uh, colony 
forming units or MPN per uh, gram of total solids, then we also satisfy the class B pathogen reduction requirements. In terms of vector attraction reduction, we want to get at least 38% uh, reduction of volatile suspended solids to prove that we've met the vector attraction requirements. Or we can uh, test the digested sludge measuring the specific oxygen uptake rate. And the specific oxygen uptake rate is less than or equal to one and a half milligrams of oxygen per hour per gram of total solids at 20 degrees C, then we have satisfied the vector attraction reduction requirements of 503 regulations for class B sludge. So if we look at what's impacting the, the performance of the digester and how well we destroy the volatile solids, it primarily depends upon the temperature at which we're operating and the sludge age at which we're operating. So what we do, we typically we'll multiply the temperature in degrees Celsius times the sludge age in days, and that will give us a number in terms of degree days. And we can go on the x-axis in this curve, and, uh, and let's say if we use a value of 1,000, so if we go up at 1,000 to this curve and move across, and we see we'll get about uh, 44, 45% volatile solids reduction. As you can see, initially, as the sludge is digested, uh, we get very uh, high rate of volatile solids reduction. But then after uh, uh, a value of 500 uh, degree days, then you see the curve flattens out and we get some additional volatile solids reduction. But this is an important curve to determine again what we can expect depending upon our temperature and sludge age uh, at which we're operating the digester. So let's look at one scenario here. Let's say we're operating a conventional activated sludge process and the uh, SRT or sludge age in the activated sludge process is 10 days and we want to achieve a VSS destruction of 45% in the aerobic digester. We'll operate at a temperature of 20 degrees C. Well, from the previous figure, we go up at, um, said uh, 1100, go up at 1100. Uh, well, we won't achieve 45% reduction. So if, to achieve 45% reduction, we'll need a temperature times sludge age of at least 1100. So we take 1100 and we're going to operate at 20 degrees C. So 1100 divided by 20, that calculation gives us a time of 55 days. So our solid retention time in the digester should be at least 55 days uh, to achieve uh, the 45% volatile suspended solid reduction. And again, our oxygen requirements are going to be 2.3 times the uh, pounds of VSS destroyed. In scenario number two, where we're operating maybe an oxidation ditch, extended aeration activated sludge, or SBR process, and the operating SRT in the activated sludge process is 40 days, the sludge is already well digested when it comes out of the activated sludge process. So our VSS destruction goal would be 45%, uh, again, designed to C. And to achieve 45% destruction, going back to our previous curve, we need a, a degree day value of 1100. 1100 divided by 20, we need 55 days um, of digestion time to achieve the 45% VSS destruction. But empirically, again, uh, in the activated sludge process, we've achieved 40 days of digestion in the activated sludge process. So uh, empirically, we only need another 15 days of digestion to achieve uh, the 45% VSS destruction. Now, if we're trying to satisfy the 503 regulations, they may not allow us to consider the uh, SRT in the activated sludge process. But in this particular case, again, we're only going to get about an additional 3% uh, reduction of volatile suspended solids uh, 
by, by the aerobic digester. So uh, one thing that I do when I go out to visit treatment plants and they're employing aerobic digestion of sludge, one of the things I really want to look at is how much they're running their aeration equipment in the aerobic digester. I visit some plants and they have an oxidation ditch and we're looking at a scenario like this and I ask them how often are you running your aerators in your aerobic digester? And they say, we run them 24 seven. Well, I tell them immediately, we, can, we don't need to run 24 hours a day because the sludge is pretty well digested because it's been in the activated sludge process for 40 days. So that we don't really need much additional digestion. Our oxygen requirements are, are not very high at all uh, because the sludge is already well digested and we can run, possibly run, I've had them turn down the aerators from 24 seven to maybe running the aerators only four to eight hours a day, um, seven days a week and with considerable energy savings as we do that. So again, it's understanding the liquid process as well as the aerobic digestion process to accomplish energy savings. Supernatant quality is important. Uh, the supernatant quality for an aerobic digester is gonna be better than for an anaerobic digester typically. Um, you see some estimated values here. These are Dr. Moore's numbers looking at the literature um, in an aerobic digester supernatant, uh, about 40 milligram per liter of nitrate nitrogen, 120 milligram per liter of TKN, probably 500 to 1,000 milligram per liter of COD, 35 milligram per liter of orthophosphorus, about 100 to 200 milligram per liter of BOD5, three or 400 milligram per liter suspended solids and pH of 5.7 to 8.0. Now, in some cases, the, the supernatant quality will be a little bit better than this. In other cases, supernatant quality can be, uh, I see numbers much worse than this, but this is, uh, I would say, what you could typically expect as far as supernatant quality. And that's important as we send that waste stream back to the head of the activated sludge process to be retreated. Another thing that's important to consider, we saw that we had in the supernatant about 40 milligrams per liter of nitrate nitrogen. So what we'd like to do is, is take advantage of that. So in our aerobic digester, uh, I would uh, normally suggest uh, that we turn off the aeration equipment, maybe four hours a day or six hours a day and let the digester go anoxic. Because again, we have maybe as much as 30, 40, 50 milligram per liter of nitrate nitrogen in the uh, liquid in the digester. So if we turn off the air for maybe four hours a day, while the, when the oxygen levels go to zero, we have that 40 or so milligram per liter of nitrate nitrogen and these facultative heterotrophic bacteria will operate in the anoxic mode and actually allow us to achieve denitrification so that allows us to get some energy savings by not running the aeration equipment. And that allows us to, uh, again, uh, biologically convert the nitrate nitrogen to nitrogen gas. And that also would generate some alkalinity, which will help us keep the digester uh, in a pH range where it's uh, performing very, very well. Uh, but if we go too long and we use up all the nitrates and we're not aerating, then we could put it into an anaerobic condition and that could cause it to uh, create settling problems when we try to settle the sludge uh, prior to decanting and could cause some nocardia bulking in our, in our process. So VSS destruction uh, depends on the nature of the sludge, uh, the hydraulic detention time, but more importantly, it determines, it depends on the solid retention time or sludge age in the digester and the operating temperature as we showed by the VSS uh, uh, destruction curve based on the solid retention time multiplied times the operating temperature in degree C. Mixing requirements, again, typically we want about 100 to 200 horsepower per million gallons of mixing intensity to provide adequate mixing in the digester. Um, 
And again, all these factors will impact that nature of the sludge, solids concentration, sludge temperature, tank depth. If we're aerobically digesting waste activated sludge and it has about one to 2% solids, uh, we may use a lower mixing intensity, but if we're uh, digesting uh, maybe primary and waste activated sludge mixed together uh, or primary sludge only, and we have maybe three or 4% uh, solids concentration, we may very well need a higher mixing intensity in the aerobic digester because of that higher solids concentration. The use of thickeners, clar thickeners clarifiers, and, and what this will do will allow us to um, recycle some of the sludge back to the digester and basically operate the digestion process in a mode similar to how activated sludge is, is operated. And that's one way again to increase the solid retention time in the digester and allow us to get a greater volatile solids reduction. So we want to have a uh, capacity to, to clarify the supernatant and settle the sludge, thicken the sludge, and it'll be removed for subsequent processing. But here's a diagram that illustrates that. We send our feed sludge into the aerobic digester. And then after it's been in the digester a certain amount of time, we send it to the thickener clarifier, we let the sludge settle. We take the thickened sludge, recycle it back to the aerobic digester take the supernatant off the top, that'll go back to the head of the plant. And then we'll take the digested sludge out of the aerobic digester for uh, subsequent processing um, or transportation to the land application site or uh, the, uh, uh, or again, subsequent uh, dewatering. Another process I'd like to mention, which is a version of aerobic digestion, and that's uh, called the ATAD process. It's gained popularity in the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years, and it's called autothermal thermophilic aerobic digestion. And we're operating in basically in the thermophilic range, 45 to 7 degree uh, Celsius. And, and using the ATAD process, uh, we can essentially pasteurize the sludge. And with, with this process, we're generally able to produce class A biosolids. So that's one advantage of using uh, the ATAD process. We produce class A biosolids. We can use smaller tankage because we have a much higher uh, oxidation rate of the biological solids. Typically we'll use two or more ATAD tanks in series. Normally our first tank will actually be a thickener, then the first ATAD tank, then the second ATAD tank, and then we'll go into a, a fourth tank, which will be a cooling tank and thickening tank uh, after the sludge has been digested. Uh, external heating is not needed because these tanks are covered and insulated and we generate uh, a good bit of heat by the oxidation of the volatile solids so that we can operate these tanks if they're heated and insulated. We do not need external heat to maintain the temperatures that are desired. So this is a kind of a, a cutaway view of the uh, ATAD, one type of ATAD process to produce class A biosolids. We've got our reactor. Um, we got the uh, insulation, uh, we have our aeration equipment. Typically the aeration equipment will be some type of aspirating aeration equipment to provide mixing and oxygen transfer. Uh, and, and in the ATAD process, it's not uncommon that we'll, the oxygen demand may at times exceed the oxygen supply to the reactor and we'll have micro aerobic conditions develop and sometimes even uh, anaerobic conditions develop for a short period of time. And under those conditions, we can actually uh, uh, ferment some of the uh, protein material uh, to various end products. And, uh, and, and some of those end products will contribute to foaming. So we're typically gonna have a layer of foam at the top of the uh, digester. So we wanna have about one and a half to three feet of uh, freeboard 
uh, above the foam layer in order to uh, uh, keep the process working well and, and not allowing foam to uh, you know, reach the top of the digester. We're pulling, the, typically pull the gas off the top of the digester and the gas can be very odorous because we're gonna, we're not going to nitrify in the ATAD process. So we're gonna have a good bit of ammonia in the off gas and because of the microaerobic or anaerobic conditions that can develop, uh, we can actually generate uh, some hydrogen sulfide, some mercaptans. And so the off gases are gonna be very odorous and we'll need to provide uh, some degree of odor control for the ATAD system. Here you see two actual ATAD tanks. And again, we generally operate with at least two and we uh, operate them generally in series. Uh, we can operate at a much lower hydraulic retention time and still achieve really good DSS destruction. Uh, pathogens can be reduced to basically below detectable levels. So that's how we can uh, produce a class A biosolids. It's a very robust process, uh, but it's going to be more challenging to design and operate. And we can achieve 40% VSS destruction in a matter of about four to eight days uh, as compared to maybe uh, 40 days in the conventional aerobic digester. In terms of energy use, about 440 to 640 kilowatt hours per ton of total solids destroyed. The advantages of aerobic sludge digestion, uh, the capital costs are gonna be lower than an anaerobic digestion process, especially if the uh, design flow rate of the activated sludge process is less than uh, 5 million gallons a day. Uh, but in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, we've actually designed aerobic digestion processes for activated sludge plants to treat flows as high as 50 million gallons a day and, and used it effectively. Aerobic digestion compared to anaerobic digestion is relatively easy to operate. We generally don't produce nuisance odors. The supernatant is uh, usually low in BOD suspended solids and ammonia. Uh, we can uh, destroy uh, the grease content or a good bit of the grease content in the sludge mass. And again, we can uh, achieve a fairly good destruction of pathogens, usually up to about 85% destruction of pathogens during aerobic digestion. We can deal with a, a wide range of, of sludge. It can be primary sludge, primary plus trickling filter sludge, uh, primary plus waste activated sludge. It can be waste activated sludge only. So again, the process is minimal to different type of biological sludges. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about gas issues like we do in anaerobic digestion with uh, uh, the gas is produced uh, being uh, possibly uh, uh, explosive in an aerobic digestion process under certain conditions. And we don't have to worry about overpressure concerns uh, that we might have to worry about in an anaerobic digester process with a uh, fixed cover. And it's fairly resistant to variations in uh, solids loading, pH and metals interference and that gives us uh, more flexibility in the aerobic uh, digestion process. Some of the disadvantages of aerobic digestion, we can produce a digested sludge uh, that typically will not dewater well in the dewatering process. We have high power cost because of the oxygen requirements. Uh, the process is significantly impacted by temperature, location, type of tank design. Uh, we don't produce a usable byproduct such as methane that we generate during anaerobic digestion. And there is a possibility that we generate odors uh, if it's not properly operated. And one last thing we'd like to look at are some of the potential operating problems. Clogging of the diffusers if we're using a diffused air system, uh, foaming odors, uh, may not get excellent pathogen destruction, uh, potential grease buildup in the digester, um, digester return overflow uh, may be uh, difficult to deal with, uh, may have settleability problems in the uh, 
thickener uh, if we, especially if we have a made formation of nicardia or other filamentous bacteria in the digester. And then we we'll always have to worry about potential for uh, aeration equipment failure in the process. So again, in summary, when we go out and visit a, an activated sludge process, it's using aerobic digestion. I would encourage you to look at the aerobic digester and because usually there's some potential for energy savings, uh, especially in ways that are mentioned in the presentation. So we certainly want to uh, try to achieve those energy savings if possible. So again, thank you for participating in this presentation. If you have questions, you can contact me at mlareabellsouth.net or if you have comments, you can contact Tom Winning at Oak Ridge National Labs. So thanks again, have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you for the next presentation. Thanks.